Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. You are attending the DBRS Morningstar webinar on the U.S. Structured Settlement ABS methodology update. My name is Stephanie Ma. I am a researcher in our Structured Finance Group, and today I am joined by my colleague, Sergey Masenko, an MD in our U.S. ABS Group and the lead analyst for Structured Settlements. A couple housekeeping items. Please feel free to type in any questions that you may have throughout the presentation. You should see a question mark on the bottom of your panel. You can click and type in any questions that you may have, and we will address your questions at the end of the webinar. To give some perspective before we start the discussion, DBS Morningstar has a long history of rating securitizations backed by structured settlements and currently has roughly outstanding ratings on 43 transactions. Despite the stresses of the ongoing pandemic, structured settlement securitizations have continued to perform well with zero or minimal reported defaults and losses due in large part to the generally high credit quality of annuity providers and life insurers. In addition, strong credit performance has allowed more seasoned transactions to gradually build credit enhancement, which provides extra protection from potential negative rating migration over time. Now, let me give a brief roadmap of today's webinar. First, we will cover the basics and discuss the elements of a structured settlement, highlighting the differences between guaranteed and non-guaranteed. And then we will examine DBRS Morningstar's analytical framework and our approach in rating structured settlement ABS. Sergey, perhaps as a starting point, you can walk the audience through the updates to our structured settlement methodology that was introduced earlier this year in January. Um, absolutely, Stephanie, thank you. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Yes, indeed, in uh, January 2022, uh, we finalized our updated Structured Settlements ABS rating methodology. Uh, the methodology has been in place for uh, quite a long time, uh, but mostly focused on uh, guaranteed Structured Settlements. And uh, after the update, the methodology also incorporates analytical approach addressing the so-called life contingent or unguaranteed structured settlements. Um, in other words, the settlements that contain a plaintiff mortality risk, in addition to the credit risk of the insurance company, which is inher inherent in all structured settlement securitizations. Such uh, life contingent structured settlements account for a um, fairly substantial portion of the overall structured settlements marketplace and uh, the um, incorporation of the uh, analytical approach uh, to addressing such life contingent structured settlement in methodology um, addresses potential need um, of the marketplace and market participants to have a clear roadmap uh, to how analytically approach um, approach them. Uh, we obviously, uh, after finalizing the methodology in uh, January 2022, DBRS Morningstar, uh, we can apply the methodology to rate both uh, guaranteed and un unguaranteed structured settlements and or pools that mix both types of structured settlements, i.e. mixed pool transactions as well. And Sergey, with that in mind, I think it would be helpful to go into a bit more detail on the specific changes, namely the consideration of guaranteed versus non-guaranteed structured settlements. Yes. Um, like I said, all structured settlements um, incorporate the credit risk of the counterparties. Uh, essentially, those counterparties are um, annuity paying um, insurance companies. However, the key difference between uh, guaranteed structured settlement securitization and the life contingent structured settlement securitization is that the letter will also need to address the um, annuitant mortality risk um, in addition to credit risk of the uh, annuity paying life um, insurance companies. Um, as a quick rema reminder, um, structured settlement is um, an agreed upon agreement uh, where insurer makes payments to the injured party claimant over multiple periods of periods of time instead of a lump sum. Um, those structured settlements can vary in their uh, terms regarding the amounts paid, structure, timing, um, and payments can be made monthly or less frequently. 
Uh, once settled, uh, the timing and size of periodic payments um, typically cannot be uh, modified or changed. And um, under the terms of the agreement between the claimant, the defendant, defendant insurer, either the defendant or insurer is obligated to make series of future payments, like I said. So while the insurer may choose to make the stream of payments directly, in many situations, it elects to remove the obligations from its balance sheet. In this case, the payment liability is assigned to SIME, which is often another um, related or unrelated insurance company or an affiliate of the insurer that focuses on this type of specialized transaction. Uh, the arrangement also lets the insurer and the claimant gain access to certain tax benefits associated with structured settlements. And so to facilitate and better document the making of these future payments, the um, insurer, a signee entity or defendant typically purchase an annuity contract from a life insurance company. And so those life insurance company will be the credit um, risk in the any structured settlement transaction, they will be pay, paying obligors under this annuity contract. In a structured settlement, to become a structured settlement receivable, um, when the need um, in uh, immediate financing arises, the claimant may take the um, structured settlement to the court and this judge determines that there is a financial need. Uh, the judge may approve um, the uh, sale of uh, the stream of payments under the annuity contract um, to the structured settlement company, structured settlement originator, in exchange for a lump sum of money. And that transfer order approved by the court becomes binding for all parties involved. And so, as, as shown on the uh, slide, guaranteed structured settlement very simply pays the claimant annuity amounts over a predetermined period of time, um, over time horizon uh, with certainty. And when the um, structured settlement receivable is transferred to the structured settlement originator, all or part of these payments will be paid over the same time horizon to the structured settlement originator. Now, Sergey, maybe we can go into a bit more uh, details on how the unguaranteed or life contingent structured settlement differs from the traditional guaranteed one. Well, unguaranteed, as you can see um, on the next slide, um, uh, basically it represents obligation under uh, which uh, the annuity payments um, made until the death of the claimant or annuitant. Um, such life contingent obligations are therefore subject to mortality risk. And um, this is basically the key difference, as I pointed out earlier, um, in addition, unguaranteed structured settlements may be either hedged or unhedged. A hedged structured settlement has the benefit of a related, duly executed, fully enforceable life insurance contract uh, with the claimant named as the insured individual and the structured settlement originator who purchased uh, structured settlements from the claimant named as beneficiary. So under this construct, uh, the holder of hedged asset receives the cash flow stream from the structured settlements until the time of claimant's death, after which the, uh, be as beneficiary, it will receive the death benefit payment pursued to the life insurance policy. On the flip side, um, the, um, the uh, beneficiary um, may be responsible for payment of the premium payments on the life insurance policy to maintain it, unless those premium payments are paid up front. Um, unhedged structured settlement, um, a life contingent structured settlement has no life insurance policy associated with, with it. Um, and so it's fairly simple. Um, the cash flows just seize upon the death of the related claimant and no additional amounts are collected by the structured settlement originator. Thank you, Sergey. Next, if you could uh, walk us through DBRS Morningstar's analytical approach to rating structured settlements and the various assumptions, uh, I think that would be great for the audience. Um, sure. Um, obviously, I, I think, you know, even though uh, we wanted to focus 
a bit more on uh, life contingent structured settlements today, I think it makes sense to start with a brief overview of the overall framework and the quantitative analytical approach for all pools of structured settlement, settlements, whether they are guaranteed or unguaranteed, they have to address the um, credit uh, risk of the underlying um, insure, uh, obligors uh, with, who are represented, as we discussed, by the life insurance companies that pay under the annuities, typically. Uh, and uh, only for the life contingent structured settlements, uh, there is also a need to address the claimant mortality risk, uh, which is addressed in our methodology by adjustment to the expected cash flows from um, structured settlements. Um, so the, let's talk about credit risk first. Um, so insurance company credit strength analysis typically relies on credit opinion regarding corresponding carrier's financial strength rating and uses two approaches under our methodology to assess the stressed cumulative gross default or net loss hurdle rate <clears throat> for the collateral pool. One is called largest obligor analysis and another one is CLO asset model analysis. Um, when we conduct both, uh, we pick the highest stress hurdle rate derived using these both methods as the one uh, that the transaction will have to clear. Uh, the largest obligor analysis typically defaults three to five carriers, depending on the requested uh, rating for the tranche or for the transaction, and then applies recoveries to in a range of 50 to 70% range to come up with cumulative net loss hurdle. Uh, we select the largest three to five carriers uh, with ratings lower than the anticipated rating for a tranche or a transaction. For example, if the um, transaction rated as a single tranche transaction and if it's rated single A, we will typically select four to five largest obligors with rating equivalent of A low or, or less um, and, um, and assume that they, are, they will default. Uh, the CLO asset model analysis uh, focuses on the default and loss risk from the overall carrier exposures in the collateral pool and um, estimates losses at different statistical confidence intervals that correspond to a given rating level by, by running a proprietary predictive model, the CLO asset model. Um, the Quantitative analysis for life contingent structured settlements also applies assumptions with respect to annuitants' life expectancy in order to adjust the um, such structured settlements payment streams. Um, in case of hedged unguaranteed structured settlements, in addition to all of this, the insurance premiums paid on the related life insurance policies, unless, like I said, paid up front, and the payouts on such life insurance policies uh, also adjusted. Um, the calculation is used then to project expected base case mortality adjusted contractual uh, cash flows on life contingent structured elements. The projection considers factors uh, like uh, US uh, life expectancy as well as distribution of the underlying pool claimants in terms of gender, age, health risks. Uh, the way we do that is by referring to mortality tables published by the well-established and generally accepted third-party sources. Um, we, we use, uh, for example, those uh, tables published by the CDC, Central uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And uh, we typically would supplement uh, such information by the annuitant-specific risk adjustment. Uh, that is based on additional information which may be provided uh, by uh, reputable actuarial experts. Um, originators, uh, for example, may hire Fasano Associates to perform that additional adjustments for them. Thanks for that very um, comprehensive overview, Sergey. Maybe, maybe we can go into a bit more detail on the stresses that DBRS Morningstar applies and specifically in regard to expected mortality adjustments. Yes, um, to determine the stress case mortality adjusted contractual payment schedules, we 
uniformly apply then a stress multiplier to inspect case mortality um, adjusted cash flows for each claimant. Um, and the resulted stressed mortality adjusted collateral cash flows then are overlaid with default stresses derived from the largest obligor analysis and CLOSF model analysis, meaning um, that we, we combine these cash flows, adjusted, stress-adjusted cash flows for unguaranteed structured settlements with cash flows uh, for guaranteed structured settlements by each unique life insurance company obligor. So if you have a mixed pool structured settlements where, let's say, Pacific Life also is the payor uh, on a regular guaranteed structured settlements, but they also happen to be a payor on life contingent one, the mortality adjusted life contingent um, uh, stress cash flows will be then combined with the guaranteed structured settlement cash flows from the same payor and uh, the, the those consolidated exposure to that obligor will be reflected in the largest obligor analysis and CLOS model analysis. We can um, also vary the stress uh, within the applicable multiple range. As you see, the ranges are fairly wide. We can apply additional stress or I'll even uh, reduce the stress because the ranges are um, designed to be in, in indicative ranges. Uh, based on our assessment of the quality um, and um, robustness of the information used to develop the expected uh, cash flow schedule. Uh, the choice of multiple may also be influenced by characteristics of the collateral pool, for example, age groups, um, if um, the pool kind of tilts towards um, older or younger age group, or as well as the gender of the annuitants, male versus female. I think we've covered quite a bit uh, of material in a short period of time. This concludes our prepared remarks for the webinar, but we want to open up the discussion for q and I'm sure that you all have probably have a lot of questions uh, given the material that Sergey covered. Again, you will see a question mark on the bottom of your panel. You can click on and type out any questions. Let me just check our board and see if we have any. Okay, I see one. Sergey, do you expect to see a proliferation of life contingent structured settlements make their way into securitizations versus guaranteed structured settlements? Um, I wouldn't put it exactly this way, Stephanie, um, versus, I think, you know, first of all, uh, the simple answer would be it, it's, it's hard to tell. The, the market for structured settlements in general has migrated to towards more being a bilateral, often private, uh, transactions. Um, you don't see these days um, as many transactions done in the term public um, ABS space as you used to. Um, that being said, the uh, market size um, is market remains a very sizable market. And um, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning of um, our webinar, um, life contingent structured settlements uh, form a substantial portion of the overall structured settlements receivables out there. So it's not inconceivable to think that life contingent structured settlements um, already are part of many of the bilateral um, and or privately executed transactions, either rated or unrated, and will continue to be uh, part of the collateral or uh, even exclusively forming collateral for single transaction in the future. Great, thanks, Sergey. See, last call for any questions. Uh, I see one more. Does DBRS Morningstar revise or account for changes in life expectancy rates given generally longer lifespans more recently? Um, well, the, the interesting thing about um, life expectancy in the U.S., it, it hasn't been uh, growing as, as much um, in the past decade, I would say almost. Um, I think it peaked 
around 2014, but then um, the, um, the, the, the there were no no growth um, above the, that level. Um, unfortunately, uh, driven by by and large by increasing overdose deaths, for example. Um, th there was some pickup, I think, um, in the years going into pre-pandemic, but well-publicized fact that in 2020, the life expectancy for that year kind of dropped by a year and a half or, or so. Um, so uh, we are sort of kind of like a stalled, um, um, more or less slightly declined compared to the peak um, position. And so at, at this point, we don't think we, we need to, in particular, adjust for, um, you know, forecast uh, for lengthening of um, uh, life of population. Okay, great. Thanks, Sergey. Let me just check to see if any other questions came through. Okay, I, I believe we have addressed all the questions posed. We want to thank every one of you for taking time out of your day to spend with us. Special thanks to Sergey for joining us and sharing his invaluable insights on the structured settlement sector.